you know, some organizations may be frustrated, like, why can't I get my team to fill in the blank, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, do they know they can fail? Do they know that? Like, if everybody's under this impression that there's always somebody that's snap of a finger ready to replace them, you might not, you might not get that extra little bit in the gas tank from them because they want to be safe, you know? If you got a, if you got, if you have a, if you've cultivated an environment, a culture in your team, your, you know, or your company, like, dude, I'm not going to chop your head off if you fail. Like, we, we learn as we move, <laughs> move on. Just learn from your mistakes. If it wasn't a, a mistake of, you know, like, attitude or character, if there's, if it's a, you know, if it's a coaching moment, let's coach. You know, if it's, I mean, if you make a mistake because <laughs> you're a rotten person, out you go. But, I mean, a different story. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook, the podcast where we welcome business leaders, CEOs, and industry experts to discuss the rise to the top, building wealth, and real estate insights. Here's your host, Jeremy Spann. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook. For more information on this show, you can go to the website, myexperiencerealtor.com. That's experience with an ED for my fellow Marines out there. And myexperiencerealtor.com. Click on podcasts and you can download this episode, other episodes, from all the different platforms, even listen to it on the website itself. And of course, if you're going to buy and sell real estate anywhere on the planet, need a trusted professional like the Span Group, even if it's not in DFW, go back to the homepage, click find a trusted professional, and we will get you connected with the right people to take care of wherever you're buying and selling real estate. But we're not here to talk about that today. We're here today where you can scroll down and click the read more on fabulous guests, friends, fellow Marine, Eric Kazmaier. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. So it only took me how long to get you here? <laughs> it, uh, it it took a couple tries here. It took a couple tries. <laughs> it took a couple tries. I had to, I had to, I don't know. I just had to kind of work up to it, warm yeah. up to the idea. I mean, with you being an extrovert and all, right? Yeah, I'm just totally out of my, out, <laughs> outgoing. <laughs> totally outgoing. <laughs> so I do a dumb joke in the beginning of all these because <clears> my <throat> father-in-law, when I first started the show, said, hey, you should do a joke. And then now he's like, please stop doing jokes. And now I intentionally go as bad as I can. So I thought this one might be fitting. So both of us being in the military is, what do you call someone who just got run over by a tank? I don't know what. Crunchy. <laughs> 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 oh God! It, 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 look, there's no reason anybody should laugh at any of these, and, uh, and I, I'm definitely not going to make a. I laughed my back <laughs> off at that, that one joke he told to the game wardens. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. That was yeah. a perfectly selected joke. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure they found it as funny. They might have sympathetically laughed during the show, but I may have got, may or may not have gotten a lecture afterwards like, hey. I, he did not just not say funny. that's a game word. <laughs> I mean, big surprise coming out of me, right? Like, what can Span say to be very, very annoying? So, you and I share a path in our life that you took much longer than I did during it. Good. United States Marine Corps. Yep. Yeah. How many years did you do? I did 20. Just about 20 on the button there. 20 on yep. the button. What year did you go in the Marines? 97. 97. Uh, I graduated from high school. Uh, Where did you graduate from? Sacramento, California. Okay. Uh, I did not have a Texan accent here. Yeah, the... Uh, you know, growing up, I didn't didn't really know what I was gonna do. Kind of fart around for a year or so, and then uh, all my roommates at the time bailed at the same time. So, thinking about options, and decided to see what the recruiter could do to get me on a plane before the following Friday when the rent was due. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was my uh, my charismatic entry into the into the Marine Corps. Had no intention of sticking around for a lifetime but you know I, I joined up and I was so naive I had no idea what I was doing I was just like I just want to be a marine you can you know yeah. I don't care just send whatever sign I'll sign that let's go did you know what you wanted to do when you went in the marines no idea no, no. Idea. but 
you know, I, I started out as uh, an electronic radio repairman. Yeah. It was cool. It was kind of fun to learn things I'd never thought I'd learn. Some, somehow I'd, I must have circled the right answers in the, in the right shape of like a smiley face or a, you know. You colored whatever. inside the lines? Inside the lines. <laughs> <I, laughs> yeah, at the Marine, uh, the MEP Center, they held up a, a card and said, what color is this? I was like, that's blue. <laughs> I said, what shape is this? That's a square. Like, you'd be a great Marine. Line up. <laughs> <laughs> and off you went. Yep. I'm going to pause for a quick second. It picks up the sound when you do that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're good. If you see me pick up my phone like this, it's just mm-hmm. letting you know, hey, we're, we're doing that. All right, we're going to continue. <laughs> so you enter the Marine Corps, 1997, get out of boot camp, go to comm school, mm-hmm. and then where do you end up from there? So I get orders to Okinawa. Okay. Uh, go to the, a comm unit and then they're uh, in Okinawa. And I remember... I remember seeing the uh, the recon guys up there. And where where were you in Okinawa at this time? My first, I was at Camp Hansen. Hansen, out yeah, where Senville was outside. Yeah, right outside yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, right outside. Um, I don't remember where it was. I think I was I was on a Cobra Gold in Thailand. Oh, I remember yeah. seeing those recon guys at the air, airport, just like having a way better time than I was having. <laughs> they were joking and laughing, and, and you know. They had a long hair. They did, did, wore wore their uniform a little bit differently. I'm just totally envious of what's going on over there. Like we were not having any fun. <laughs> like we were, we were just sitting on the flight line, just waiting for time to pass. So I got you know got the uh, got the direction. I'm like I'm I'm, good. I'm doing that. So I trained up. I wasn't a very good swimmer, but at, you know at the time. So I started swimming and threw a rock on my back. Started hiking and trying to get in shape and. You know, by the by the time I took the the, the indoc is is what you have to it's a it's an indoctrination period where they just just make life miserable for you as much as as miserable as they can for as long as they can to see if you really want to do it you know so you know I, by the time I took that indoc I was made of twist steel and sex appeal I was ready I was ready to take it on and and I passed it and you know got orders and the rest was history. By the time I got there, I was like, "What did I do?" <laughs> I was like, "What the fuck was I thinking?" What? <laughs> why did I? What? Oh man! The first night I was there, there, I get uh, assigned to a room in the barracks. My roommate was a fellow roper, so when you're when you're awaiting your opportunity to go to the recon school, you have to wear this rope ostensibly so you can practice knots because you have to be proficient in knot time but really it's so that everyone around you can identify who the new guy is so i was that new guy roper for a little while and while i was there man remember that first night met my roommate my corporal who was uh you know responsible for shaping me into a recon marine opened so the door basically a haze fest oh yeah well it started yeah pretty quick <laughs> There's these these thick books of knowledge you have to memorize. It's a team leader's handbook, right? Easily several hundred pages thick. So he unbound it, threw it into my room like confetti everywhere. And my job that night was to put all the pages back in order and have it re-tied up, bound with 550 cord, you know, five bound with a little string. And uh, show up the next day, so I stay up all night. But it was a good way to learn. I, I looked, I read every page of that thing one <laughs> night. <laughs> Contrary to belief, Marines can read, especially recon Marines. Yeah, yeah, oh, no. yeah especially those pages turn like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to the end doc period, right? So just, yeah. um, you know, we got a lot of audience out there. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I would say that, um, and, I, and I believe you probably agree with me is. Out of all of the special operations communities amongst all the different branches, I would say that that recon in the Marine Corps is the most unknown to yeah. the generalized public. I mean, even Marines in the Marine Corps really didn't know what recon did, right? 
Or, yeah. or there's a joke to be like, where's recon? And they're like, I don't know, doing recon stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to give the audience an idea of just the selection process, right? I mean, this mm-hmm. is just not, uh, I mean, look, these are, these are, these are top tier folks that get a chance to show up to, to sure. game day to get tested, right? So in the end doc, talk to me about, you know, what, what goes through that end doc. I, I, I've been a part of a, a few of them, taking several of them and running several, and they all have a couple things that that have to happen. You know, there there's a there's a water borne portion. You know, there's a pool portion where you have to prove that you can swim under a time limit. You have to be able to, you know, carry heavy objects while you're swimming swim underwater so there's like some some basic boxes that need to be checked you know there's always a an obstacle course portion um, and a lot of it's up up for you know the creativity of whoever's running it you know you know there's a there's a hike you have to make it I, I believe four miles an hour over over terrain so it's just, you have a pretty heavy rucksack while you're doing it too so those things are all a part of it, but I remember when I did mine, there was, you know, you're, you're exhausted and then they'll stop everything and take a blanket off of a bunch of items and you look at it, you have a couple minutes to memorize everything you can, they cover back up and then they'll quiz you on it later. Um, just things like that, keep you awake, have you, have you write an essay on some, why do I want to be in recon or some, pick, pick a topic topic isn't really to hear what kind of brilliance you can put on pen to paper it's more like just you know something to keep you awake when you're when you should be sleeping when your body wants to sleep you know they never tended to last too long i mean they would never like a day like half day to a day of of actual like in doc time but you know they're they're all they're all a little bit different well, everyone everyone runs them a little bit differently. And 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 going through the end doc, it's not just to see if somebody can physically make something, but yeah. also mentally for sure. make something. For sure. Matter of fact, I would argue that probably the assessments in the community are more mentally based than they are physically based, right? Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. You gotta be able to run, jump and swim. You gotta be able to do the basics, but for sure. You know, I mean this when it comes to physical pain, I mean the biggest mask is out there can just absorb physical pain for so long, but it's just when the, like you said, said, you know, can you function when you haven't slept? Can you mm-hmm. do X, Y, Z when you're just tired and you're exhausted and everything mm-hmm. else to see, you know, is, is this someone that's willing to also truly commit for sure to, to it. Right. And it, you, know, you, you, you said something, maybe think of the community in, in general that, Recon does a great job of pulling guys into the community who are just awesome. And, and the in-doc is absolutely a part of it. I mean, there's selection that goes. It's a, it's a big effort to try to pull the best guys into it. But the culture itself is, is you know, the in-doc is obviously a you know, day one, but every single day doesn't get any easier you know? <laughs> like, and it doesn't, it's not like you can high five and be like yeah i did did this awesome thing it, yeah that doesn't last long because now you got to do it again and, and again and again so and find something that sucks even more yeah go right? find something else yeah it's it's good but uh, i i love that speed you know i like i said i didn't plan on doing it forever but um you know i i was really blessed to have NCOs and you know, leaders that talk about what that is an NCO for the audience. So, uh, in the military, you have uh, two general paths you can you can go through in the military. You can either be an officer. Officers uh, are bred to be in in charge. They are bred to own it and run it. The the buck stops here. Enlisted, on the other hand. Uh, you enlist for usually four year stretches and from day one you're bred to get away with it <laughs> not be in charge of <laughs> until you will mature a little bit so um, I was enlisted and you know, when I 
my first enlistment when I found myself in recon. I, I, uh, you know, I was blessed to have NCO. So an NCO is somebody uh, in a leadership position among the enlisted ranks. And then beyond the NCOs, you have staff NCOs who are in, in charge of larger groups of Marines. I, you know, I was blessed to have guys who, who cared, not, you know, not willing to skip steps, you know, and it really inculcated that, that desire to do it right from day one, you know, not, you know, not just, hey, welcome aboard, but here, memorize this book and bring it in tomorrow morning. And that's the, the creativity, the, the comedy, the, the, the brotherhood, the, the tight knit disciplined community. Um, and when you say, you know, when I say discipline, I don't necessarily mean every, everyone has an image of a Marine when, when you think of a Marine and fresh shave, maybe shiny boots. It, and that's important. But during that phase of my life, when I first started in, in recon, like I kind of took a back seat. I was more focused on becoming the best field skill, you know, having the best field skills, being able to, you know, operate a radio or being a point man or shooting these guns or those guns and just being awesome at all of it. It was a, it's a life pursuit and I really enjoyed it. So much so that I just kept doing it every four years. I kept signing <laughs> <laughs> just signing up for more punishment. But it, it was it was a no brainer after a while. So, you know, especially after the the war years started kicking off, then it was, you know, I'd what I'd been in for about three years when the when the war kicked off, and I, um, so that <laughs> so here's the story. Uh, 2000, late 2002, 2003, uh, I was going in for a physical and everybody, everybody was gearing up. If you remember those times, it was, we were going off to OIF-1, we were going to Iraq, we were going to, you know, do the, do the big, the big war, you know, right before we left, uh, I found out I had cancer. It was a testicular cancer. I had it. I was, <laughs> I was just crushed. I was, all that work, you know, was described in all the discipline and training and blood, sweat, and tears. But it uh, wasn't meant to be. So I stayed back. They all went. Uh, the procedure itself was relatively uneventful, other than me losing my testicle. But I mean the. The follow-on radiation therapy, you know, like everybody handles it a little bit differently. I didn't get super sick, but I would kind of get like a uh, feeling from it. So I remember listening to AM radio. It's the first time I ever listened to AM radio, just listening to the war updates, you know, while the boys were gone. And the, uh, I even if I hear it today, it's just, it's unique. AM radio is kind of unique, has a unique sound to it. I kind of get that like, uh, <laughs> I kind of like, <laughs> gross stomach feeling but you know in the end it's not a it wasn't and there's a silver lining i i uh, met now my wife we just celebrated our 16th anniversary not too long ago um three beautiful kids so i mean i i i bounced off the path i thought i was supposed to go down and i ended up going the path that i was where i was supposed to be you know so but I healed up from from the whole cancer thing and got back into a rhythm and I had a I had a fire in my belly, you know. I went, I was ready to ready to make up for lost time. <laughs> I was so naive. I remember thinking like the whole world the war will be done by the time I get heal up and go back. And now we're <laughs> two decades later, we're still, still <laughs> we're still there. We're still there. There's plenty, <laughs> there's plenty of war to go around. Don't worry, kid. Plenty of war to go around. <laughs> But yeah, I, I got back into it. I had a you know plenty of plenty of energy to to stick around and and you know I went. I went to Iraq. Went to Afghanistan. Wait, 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 what year did you go to Iraq? 
uh, 05, 06. Who did you do deploy with that time? Uh, I was in First Force Recon Company First Force. at the time. Okay. And when I came back from that deployment, um, the transition from uh, recon to MARSOC happened. So. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that r- real quick so the yeah. audience understands. Is we, we had not been a part of the no. SOCOM community. Mm-hmm. Um, now the Marine Corps decides, okay, we're gonna have an, yeah. we're gonna have a presence in the SOCOM community, yeah. which means we gotta go stand up a unit and naturally where do we go get them from? But we got, yeah. right? A bunch of well-trained uh, barrel chested freedom fighters. It's a good place to look. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just like you said, Donald Rumsfeld, I think it was 2005 or, or so, basically poked the Marine Corps in the eye and said, you're doing this. I don't care what, whether you like it or not. This is, you're making this unit. You're you're contributing to what it evolved into a more, at that moment in time, a a, a more applicable fighting force for for the U.S. military. You know, and so uh, and I, I love the Marines. Just so arrogant. <laughs> the whole notion that that the Marine Corps would would offer a unit that's special is just completely foreign like <laughs> why why would I, I don't understand why would we offer we are we're, we don't do that like this is marine corps like <laughs> i love it this it's something i didn't appreciate at the time but now looking back my I, I love the arrogance of it it's so awesome so they go and they say okay so you're one of the first guys they they bring over right yeah so yeah. they get, go and they well if i remember right they pretty much just decimated force recon across the board right they because those did. were that's where you, that's where you're going to pick your talent from right to go stand up something that's very similar but for would sure be much different right for sure it really i mean it was just a matter of who was on what roster in this platoon and who was on because recon was packed full of like great guys and so some guys were they couldn't afford to lose them at the time because they were deploying and some guys had just got back from deployment and could cut over to this new unit. It's just, just luck of the draw, really. What was it like going to be? Because essentially, let's translate to what this means into business skill sets, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So essentially, you were a startup. Yeah, we, were, we right. ran a startup. Yeah, yeah, you had a startup, mm-hmm. right? So you go over there. There's literally a blank sheet of paper of write your own rules, write your own everything. Absolutely. Right, and so. But you got to be successful at it in order to keep at it. So sure. what were some of the things that you saw and did and learned through all of that in this startup called MARSOC? Yeah, the, um, I realized, you know, through years of, of being in the, these teams with everyone's an alpha male, everybody has an opinion, everybody has a dog in the fight trying to trying to shape whatever it may be how, how their vision is and I think um, there there are things in, in all of us in that community that really apply well to solving problems outside the military like be it how do I wear my gear is there is there yeah this is fine but maybe if I move it one spot over it's even better or you know constantly thinking of ways to improve something um if i can do something in 15 steps maybe i could trim a step off of it and save some time so really in the business world that's really like process improvement you're kind of constantly doing process improvement you know you can you can study six sigma or you know all these ways of you know teaching those principles but uh, it's it's inherent in everybody who came from that community. You're always trying to think of a better way to do something. Leading guys like that is challenging too, because you you have to you have to be able to hold your own ground. Because everybody, you know, it's it's a competitive field in, in every aspect of that word. So, um, I'd say one thing one thing I learned, you know, and, and try to keep this in every team, every unit company whatever that I was um, that I found myself in is 
I mean, the best ideas are going to come from the ground up. That's how the whole culture works. The guys in the fight are typically the ones who can come up with the best way of doing things. And I, I think that is definitely something that I've, that's tattooed in my DNA now. Once, you know, everybody may have an opinion on something, but once the table is slapped, once the, the leader of that team has made a decision, all of those ideas are now, it's, it's, it's our decision. It doesn't matter how passionate you were about trying to make something happen. You know, once that table is slapped, it's our, our decision and we move on. And that's a, that's a professional environment. And, and give, an exa- like give, an ex- give an example of that. So, like, so let's say we're preparing for a mission in Afghanistan. Say the, say the, the route you have to take is maybe funneled in some areas, and you know, you, a big threat in Afghanistan was always running over mines or IEDs. So, I may have an idea of skirting it this way. Another guy may have an idea of skirting it that way, or maybe just rethinking the entire thing and flying in. All these ideas may come as we're brainstorming ways to attack this. And we'll de- develop different courses of action. Say like, this is a, my best course of action and second, third or whatever. And I may feel passionately about one way, but once the once the decision has been made, I'm, I'm not subversive and, you know, I'm, I'm not holding on to my pride or whatever I thought. I, Whatever drove me to to push my my agendas out the window because it's our team. It's our it's our decision now. Yeah. So you're that, committed. This is the path. We all agree. Let's go. Yep. Time game yep. time. Let's go get it. Yep. Right. So so you're over here, and I mean, when when you guys stood up Marsock, and of course, you know, I, I'm able to ask the questions that I've asked because I've picked your guys' brains for so many years just because Marsock was definitely post my time, right, yeah. that came around. and uh, But I've always just been like the curiosity of the differences of, mm-hmm. you know, what it was like to be in the recon community versus Marsock. I mean, like, what mm-hmm. what were some of the differences between, because they, they're similar but different, they are, right? They were very, very similar. In fact, when we, that first Marsoc deployment, we we didn't train any differently. We, I mean, in fact, halfway through the the training for working up toward the deployment, we were in recon, and then the the second half we were in SOCOM. We didn't really pick up on any of the nuances until we deployed. We were partnered with a special forces team, and just getting a feel for how they operate. I mean, really all cut from the same cloth. So they're they're very much the same in many ways. I would say that the differences that you learn when you uh, leave the recon community and, and go into the SOCOM community is now you have more assets at your disposal and there are a couple of new skill sets that you have to learn um, just because now you have the permission to do them you know were the missions different they were um whereas in in recon you may be partnered with an iraqi unit or an afghan unit but that's not your reason for being there your reason to go kick ass really i mean right but uh in in socom that really is your job you're there to to go in small numbers uh affect uh a, a country's military and improve it, kind of guide them, assist them, accompany them and when they're doing what they're doing and really under the the model of we're we're gaining our nation's objectives, but not by putting hundreds of our our US citizens in in harm's way. Why don't we encourage the, the host nation to to do that. That way it's sustainable after we leave, you know, and we don't want to be there forever, right? No, no one has the stomach for that, regardless of how long we've been in Afghanistan. But that's the point, like, 
that concept was was new to us and like i had never really given it much thought until i became a part of socom and marsoc and and those those ideas were were taught to us and driven thoroughly in, into how we make decisions how how big was the team size at marsoc they were uh they, they varied they started out looking a lot like recon platoons um i think now you probably like the core group of guys you probably i don't know maybe like 12 15 or so yeah. it was kind so of where we all run around with six in the beginning and then so yeah off. like re yeah. recon teams would typically be like six guys or so yeah um but sometimes you know say your team is say all together so here's a unique thing about um the way MARSOC operates, which really borrowed from recon, was you get you get a lot of a, attachments to your team. So your say your team is nothing but just MARSOC raiders, like Marine raiders. But we'll we may have a dog handler join our team. We may have uh, you know an EOD tech join our team and. All these add-ons, these these bolt-ons. We'll have Corman join the team, and maybe a couple of comm guys. You know, by the end of the, we're rolling deeper than that we would have had we just been that core group. So they're now they're all the team, but that's how Marsoc teams would operate. That's how Raiders would operate. They they would bolt on a few more guys, and those those support guys that made that team made us absolutely more capable and more unique, which was something you know especially towards the end of my career i, I appreciate it a lot you know because so how many how many times did you deploy with marsoc it's uh one two three four four, four times four times okay and then you had a deployment with first force deployment with first force okay. so mm -hmm. let's go from deploying with first force and then deploying the first time as marsoc was was there quite a bit of differences in between the two for sure for sure for yeah. sure yeah I, I in the, the recon deployment um it's it was it's it's just kind of hit or miss with with how you know it's okay so we're back to my disappointment of you know not being able to go into combat you know we're, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the psyche of a marine like think of you're like a, a dog in a cage and you're just getting poked at and that that's how we feel you know we're just like we're getting mad and then by the time it's ready to go and open the door and get them you know yeah. that's where that's where guys who are in these platoons that's how they think that's how they want to get after there they want to sink their teeth into it so that one iraq deployment although we we're a little bit of that it, it would wasn't quite what I was hoping for, you know. It was, and, but and it's not that every recon deployment is like that. It was mine was, you know? yeah. And others felt similarly, you know, to how I felt, just a little bit underwhelmed. Not the same for all my uh, SOCOM deployments. They were, they were, they were, we were given more latitude to to solve bigger problems. Uh, not necessarily take bigger chances, but make bolder moves, you know? And that's that's what I like. And that, I really grew fond of that autonomy, you know? Yeah. I, I dig that. That was what I was gonna ask is, you know, it just seemed like you had a lot more autonomy yeah. in the MARSOC side of things mm -hmm. uh, than over there. So then, all right, so you deploy uh, first time with MARSOC and then you go back for a second deployment. Big difference between mm -hmm. the first and the second? They were. I mean, each one was each one was wildly different. Um, you know, I even went to the same area of Afghanistan over and over again. Every time I went, I would I'd be in a different you know, leadership position because you would you advance in rank eventually, you know, and start picking up more responsibility. From the first one to the second one, yeah, it, it, it was different. Like one, our mission was different. Whereas the first one, we were we were doing everything in trucks. Like we lived in our trucks. The, the second one, we were in a little bit more uh, 
austere environments. You know, we had to kind of worry more about guarding the wire, <laughs> like dodging mortars and stuff like that. <laughs> but you know, it was there were definitely more IEDs on the second one. That was like oh nine around the oh nine time frame. Or yeah, there were. But I mean, it was just a different, slightly different location, different. Even the, even the, the terrain changes every couple of years. There's they focus on different areas harder and fight fight harder in certain areas. So, you know, and then the next one, we almost exclusively flew on helicopters everywhere we went, you know. And we were partnered with a, a partner force that was, you know, a lot more capable than the ones I'd been partnered with prior. You know. Which way did you prefer it? Walking, riding, or flying? Oh, definitely flying. <laughs> <laughs> flying is the way to go in Afghanistan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because the train is so smooth out there, right? It's a nice little walk. <laughs> this is just like riding a skateboard down the skywalk there. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I had a, a, a friend of mine a couple of years ago. His kid was getting close to graduation and was like, hey, you know, my kids think about going to the military. He wants to be a spec ops guy. You know, you talk to him. And I said, uh, so, yeah, so I'll talk to him. I said, well, why do you, why do you want to go do this? You know, he's like, God, country, blah, blah. And I was like, ah, okay, no, no. What? Why do you want to go do mm-hmm. this? And he's like, well, I want to be with like-minded people and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I said, um, no, I mean, like, why? And he goes, well, I understand the question. I said, uh, you're 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 going to be presented with an environment that never gets better, right? <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, I figured the training would suck." And I was like, "Oh yeah, no, it, training is like intro to suck 101. It just mm-hmm. goes downhill from there, <laughs> right?" And I said, "You you're going to get to a point where you're you're working, you know, with the most talented people on earth." But when do you think they call you? And then a little bit of overcast, slight breeze out of the north. Mm-hmm. No, it's train is impassable. Mm-hmm. The weather <laughs> sucks. Matter of fact, the weather's so bad that the drones and the satellites and everything aren't working. They're like, hey, if we only had someone dumb enough that we could send in. And you know, so but um, but it, I think that's what the the normalized audience doesn't really understand is like how much you you have to evolve Mm -hmm. right you know going from like you said trucks to you know hoofing it in to to the helos to everything because you're looking to be more effective more efficient but you know when i when i when i hear you talk about the the difference in in each deployment is you guys became experts at pivoting yeah, definitely. Right. Very agile. Very agile. Agile is is a great way to describe it. Yeah. You know, because you never, you're never figuring out the same problem over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. If you do, you write write it down and make it a procedure. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then go off to the next one. You know. Yeah. But yeah, that any, um, any opportunity uh, we could think of to to better our environment or um, capture something and share it that that just that was another part of it because we know we were and mind you like you, you mentioned startup it's it was a unique time where everyone was re-enlisting everyone s- remained in the same unit for several years which is in the military or marine corps in general uncommon but when you know, my buddy Mike is downrange. I'm talking to him, and he's giving me what he's seeing. And then when I go downrange, I'm doing the same thing. And you know, we all know each other. We're all in the same team with each other at one point or multiple times, whatever. But um, everybody's trying to figure out the the same thing, which at the time, you know, was accomplishing the mission and bringing everyone home safe. Right now, it's you know. It's a different bottom line now. Now it's really a, a bottom line, <laughs> not not so much. Uh, tell me, tell me more about that. I mean, yeah, you you definitely take the same. You know, everyone gets out eventually. You know, I got out four years ago. Um, 
ready to ready to uh, go attack you know just what's the next i'm like a missile in search of a target you know just wait where am i going i landed um at one of the guests of your uh show uh, jamie uh offered me a job brought me to texas and uh you were born here but we got here as fast as you could as fast as i could <laughs> first, first train cooking was uh wanted to go work for jamie in uh in the service uh a service company in the oil and gas industry and that was that was awesome one he already knew me he knew how to lead me and uh so he bit like kind of gave me basically the equivalent of uh here are the keys don't crash it and so i, I was like for me that was like yes that was awesome like wrap my head around the problem and kind of shape it my own way and move things around as I saw fit and I loved it. After a couple of years of that, our our operations were running 100 miles an hour, like right off a cliff. <laughs> like last spring was about when oil and gas went completely sideways. So, but I mean, you know, you take that same the same mentality of looking at a problem probably differently than anyone else looks at it and coming up with a solution that's completely different than anyone likely came up with and attacking it with the same fervor that you know I would when I was assembling that that book <laughs> my first night in recon you know just just getting after it you know just getting I, as aggressive as possible because i mean we're all wired the same way you know whether you're wearing the uniform you carry all those those traits with you into the real world uh, the the civilian world you're uh now you're you're just instead of focusing on you know what was at the time the most important thing was getting getting it done and and bringing the guys home safe now it's making your pnl nice and exactly where you want it to be or if it's not attacking those problems and trying to figure out what it was that got you there and how to how to improve it you know so you got your mba i did yeah i did and learning a business language right because it is a different language yeah, yeah, right sure <laughs> yeah We're, when you when you got your mba did that help you translate skill sets and experience from your time in the Marine Corps to be applicable, I guess yeah. that's the right word, am I saying it right or am I just making up words? To be uh, applicable, I'll, I'll just yeah. make it up, people have figured it out, uh, in the business world. I th- I'd, yeah, I'd definitely say so. I'd, I'd say the advantage of the MBA is, um, one, it's like a bona fides when you're trying to sell yourself, It's some that means a lot to some people that, that you're, you've you've gone and educated yourself that way and i'd say too like you said it accelerates the learning curve of learning that language i think a a lot of guys would pick it up after maybe a couple years they'd have a lot of the the same knowledge that was taught in that course it's just more concentrated faster more laser focused on learning all the, the core tenets of you know being able to speak that new business language which is really what i wanted you know when i was out of the marines we go to schools to learn everything you know like jumping out of planes or scuba diving or whatever you know so i'm as a typical marine like i'm going in the civilian world well, i gotta go to the school to figure that out so <laughs> <laughs> join uh join a uh university Go to, go learn some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, during uh, during your time in the Marine Corps, um, did you ever go and serve in any other positions, like you know, at the schoolhouse or anything else? Or I never did. Yeah. I never did. I was always in a, a deployable team, except for um, one short uh, period of time. Uh, I ended up more so like on the administrative side, just kind of running. It was good for me. I actually got, I got a little bit burnt out after mm-hmm. after a while. Right around you know, 2012, 2013. I I needed a I needed to take a knee, so I ended up uh, 
you know, serving in more of that. And it was good for me, actually. I, I got to hone in on some administrative skills that I totally had no time nor interest in learning when you're going 90 miles an hour, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was good for me to, to take that knee. And not that it was like easy work, but it was different work. It wasn't, it wasn't as, as gratifying as, you know, smelling, smelling gunpowder at the range or, you know. Kicking indoors. Kicking or, indoors. It's nothing yeah. that glorious, but it was, it was, it was good. Probably of that time, I, I was able to first start seeing myself as, you know, somebody who could competently sit at a desk and do something productive. <laughs> <laughs> Not like your usual uh, marine typing skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this does not work. I keep hitting them with fists. So <laughs> then, um, so you, you, when you're separating from the service, what rank are you at? I was a, an E8, or out of, out of nine ranks, I was the eighth one. So I was a, what's called a master sergeant. Okay. So let's talk about the roles and responsibilities of being a master sergeant, right? Yeah. So because at this point, you're you're still in door kicking mode, but mm -hmm. you're at more of a I hate to say management level, but I guess no, that's right. But I guess management level, right? Is I kind of right? saw it, I kind of saw it as so my last say by my last enlistment, I was probably like seventeen ish years in. I was a master sergeant. I was. Um, Starting to feel feel some injuries that I've I've collected over over a couple decades of being in, and really, I mean, at that point, I was held together by band aids and bubble gum. I was it was it was uh, it was just time for me to. It was the first time I I noticed that I wasn't moving as quickly. Mainly, like just knee surgeries just started stacking up on me, and um, you know, I just thought it was it was one time to hand it off to the next generation because um i, I just kind of reached that point where i wasn't as on fire for it as i was you know years prior um and age does catch up right age does and i was i mean yeah. some people probably laugh but i was in my late 30s when i had this epiphany yeah <laughs> but but all my other on the other hand i was also you know i would i would call it corporate leadership i was i was in corporate leadership at the time i was i was no longer uh a real boy playing with guns and <laughs> bombs and stuff and, and, and i realized you know i was like you know what if i'm if i'm uh if i'm at this point in my life where i'm a, a corporate leader I'm, I'm i'm gonna go out and be a corporate leader for uh for a company in the civilian world it's probably time to transition yeah and i think it's um you know, and I think that's a, a tough thing. Whether, whether you do four years, you do 40 years, at some point you take the uniform off or you wear, you put the uniform on one last time, whether that's your decision or the Marine Corps' decision, right? Yeah. Somebody's going to decide for you if you don't decide for yourself. But, you know, the the amount of mileage that we put on ourselves is, is pretty excessive compared yeah. to the average normal positions out there, right? For and you sure. do, especially when... And I've talked about this on some episodes. Is there's a big difference between being hurt and being injured, right? Mm. And I mean, hurt. Mm. Look, you can will your way through that, but when you're injured, rub some dirt on it, right? Rub <laughs> some dirt on. It. But when you're injured, that's when things aren't functioning, right? Yeah. And then mm. it becomes an element of will that cause me to be a burden for the rest? Of the people that I care about. So, for example, Justin that you met, right? Yep. Is we've been planning this nine-day mountaineering trip up to Mount Rainier that's supposed to kick off here in another two weeks. And then uh, I was skiing back in February, and I fell funny. Like, nothing sexy. Wasn't doing a flip, jumping off a double black diamond or anything. I was just going through some deep snow, went to turn, fell, fell goofy. And when I got up, I was like, that's different, right? And, and so I was like, okay, God, wait a minute. I hate that feeling. Uh, isn't <laughs> I it? hate that feeling. Isn't it? When you're sitting there and you're just like, like if it hurts, like I can suck it up and go through anything that hurts, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you're not talking about like, man, even when you're just exhausted and you're just like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to still keep pushing. Yeah. But when something stops functioning, it really mentally jacks with you, right? Because yeah. you're like, 
wait a minute, this is not performing the way it should. And I don't mean because I'm sore or whatever, it's just like yeah. not functioning. And then that's when, it, uh, when I made the decision back in April, cause I was like, let me just see what I can do. Let me get in there and see the ortho. And then the ortho was like, yeah, you, you're, you're not going on that trip. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, with guys like you and I, you know, high, high A's. I'm, I'm sorry. Being told that is like, what? I'm sorry. Uh, so, huh? so you're saying there's a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, there's a chance that your buddies are going to have to carry you off the mountain. And then yeah. I was just like, yeah, I don't want to be a burden to you, yep. the team. And then so you, you have to sit there and go, OK, where are my options here? Right. Yeah. And the good thing is, is there's always options. Right. And so plus there's only so much torture that we could put these human bodies through <laughs> before eventually they just they're they're just not performing right yeah. and yeah. so we we have to make a decision is you know do we do we go make a transition before i've absolutely run all the gas out of this tank yep. or do i run all the gas out of this tank and then not have as many options so you get to that point 20 years wait a minute i've still got options let me go exercise yep. some of these options right Plus, you know, deploying as many times as you did, I mean, you know, probably pretty nice to be able to actually watch your family grow up, right? That's, that's been, uh, that's been, I, that was a big factor in it. You know, I, I opted not to go with, you know, some of the options that guys in my position might choose, you know, just to do something similar, but in a slightly different way. Talking about like contracting and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, going and continuing to go down range. And yeah, the wife wasn't a big fan of that one. And I don't, I don't blame her. So, I mean, she, she stuck, stuck around for, you know, six deployments, five, six deployments. I think she, she gets to make that uh, known. And I'm glad <laughs> she did because I, it was, it's not like a, it's not like a career. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there, there's, there's a, there's, there's some, there's some limit, limiting factors there. Some at some point, like you said, it's just going to break down. So, and even rather, Jamie talked about it on his episode, right? Deployments mm -hmm. after a while just get old, right? Yeah, there, there. The last one I I did was I would I could. That's probably that last one I did. I was I just didn't have that same, uh, you know. It, it was that was probably the first notion that I was like maybe maybe this is it 20 years is about done so and this is what I think people in the business world don't uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of they don't have they don't I don't think their perception really understands what that means and I'll mm -hmm. I'll elaborate on this when and it's not that you're any less committed or anything else mm -hmm. but the drive is dwindling down, yep. which means you have to sit there and self-assess to go, if I go do this again, am I being an asset to the team or am I being a burden to the team? And the difference between the business world and of course, you know, in the military, you know, Marine Corps Recon MARSOC is when you become a burden and not an asset, yes. that means lives can get lost. It's right? true. And that's we you're talking about with high octane A players that's a, that is not an easy decision to make, right? Yeah. But you do it for the better of the business, being that that was Marsoc business, mm -hmm. you do it for the better of the business, the employees of that business, to make what's probably a, it's, it, it's probably the most unselfish decision that you can make. That's well put. Right? Well put. Unselfish decision for the betterment of the business. And and so that's what I think the business community out here can understand that is like, hey, I'm I'm going to do what's right for business and the people involved in business, even when it's an, a difficult decision for yourself to make. Um, and even when it's going to come with some costs. Mm -hmm. Right now, of course, there's benefits that follow, but but there's those costs is to be unselfish and say, uh, 
And I'm not trying to say we view ourselves as birds. We never want to think of that. But there is that thing in the back of the mind, kind of like sure. the mountaineering trip and stuff as you go. Sure. Uh, I, I, and like you said, is there's that you also got to create avenues for that next line of generation to come up and go and outperform what we did, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like, I, you know, we, you and I talk is I, you know, I, I'd be curious to go watch a uh, an Indoc or a you know oh, BRC yeah. cool. or, or or whatever, because I'd probably look at something like that and go, oh man, that looks like that's gotten a lot harder, <laughs> right? Yeah. Cause, because you, or well, it's gotten a lot smarter and sophisticated. No, no, no. They were always way harder when we did. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make that clear. That'll always be the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just they, you know, because it, it's that you got to get better, and more efficient, and sometimes. To have progress in an organization, you've got to be able to step out of the way of that progress if, if progress is being meant to be made. That's well right? said. And if you did your job correctly, you should be replaceable, you know? 1,000%. I loved – one thing I learned about military leadership, be it combat or, or otherwise, um, I grew very fond of mentoring the next generation, you know? you. I'll describe a dynamic that's often repeated, right? So you assemble a team, you work up together, you deploy together, you come back. That's probably about a two-year cycle. When you come back, half the guys leave. The guys that get out of the military, go get orders somewhere else, who knows? The guys that stay are carved up and turned into the leaders for the next team and he'd do it all over again, right? Whenever I was in that position to where I had the, the pick of the veterans, the, the, the guys who'd been there once or twice, I usually, when, when at all possible, I would be like, yeah, cool, I'll take a couple, but I'd rather have as many fresh new guys as possible because I just, I like, I like that, that, opportunity to mentor that's something i would always jump at the opportunity while i was in the military and without a doubt you know moving forward yeah and 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 that's a and that's a uh a really interesting point that you make right there is a lot of times in business people would go with what's comfortable Mm -hmm. right which is hey let me go pick the ones that know what they're doing But when you go pick ones that are new to help them evolve, it helps get out of that, um, oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Complacency, Mm -hmm. right? Because they're going to bring fresh, innovative, new ideas, right? Not to Mm -hmm. saying that the old cats don't have good, new, fresh, innovative ideas, but Mm -hmm. there's something to be said with folks that are coming in that are, that also, I'm not saying you, you, you lose your edge on desire to want to go take things to the next level, but that new freshness, mm-hmm. they want their chance to go prove it, right? Sure. So there is a certain level of hunger that's in that fresh pool. Absolutely. Right? That's, that, that, I feed off that energy. I yeah. love it. Yeah. And then to take them and help morph them into letting them make their own mistakes, Mm -hmm. right? Or what I call learning opportunities. Yeah, (laughs) learning opportunities, that's that's important. Like a lot of, you know, some organizations may be frustrated, like why can't I get my team to fill in the blank, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, Do they know they can fail? Do they know that? Like if everybody's under this impression that there's always somebody that's snap of a finger ready to replace them, you might not, you might not get that extra little bit in the gas tank from them because they want to be safe you know if you got a if you got if you have a if you've cultivated an environment a, a culture in your team your you know or your company like dude, i'm not gonna chop your head off if you fail like we we learn as we move on move on just learn from your mistakes if it wasn't a a mistake of you know like attitude or character if there's if it's a you know, if it's a coaching moment, let's coach. You know, if it's, I mean, 
if you make a mistake because <laughs> you're a rotten person, out you go. But I mean, a different story. Talk about the importance of of that is what failure means yeah. in order to develop. Yeah, to me, like I, I think of it in terms of counseling or coaching. Uh, if you if you make a a moral, you know, judgment that's questionable or, or ethical or, or or an attitude, like I was saying, or you get flipping your boss some sh- some attitude, you know. Let's have let's let's have a counseling session, you know. Come to Jesus, man. Let's let, get comfortable. You're not going anywhere for a while, <laughs> you know. But if it's a coaching, you know, if you went left when you're supposed to go right, if you um, maybe you just weren't taught the right way to do it, or maybe you forgot, or you know, whatever, you know, if there's a if there's a moment to learn from it, it's not the time to come down on somebody like a ton of bricks, or even, you know, you know, just use that use that for good because everybody deserves that. Everybody should be looking for that. You know, it's, that's that's makes you better. Yeah. So you get out. You um, you stayed back in Cali for a year, right? Yep. I remember. And then you got out here working with the beautiful Jamie Peace. Yeah. It's got more hair gel than any hair salon. <laughs> uh, and, then, uh, um, and then, of course, we know what happens to the oil and gas sector of things. And you mm-hmm. transition. Now you're doing project management, right? You're right. Uh, uh, so now, you know, so last summer I was um, parted ways with uh, the oil and gas uh, community. I mean, like thousands of other Texans <laughs> yeah. at the same time. Um, you know, I I was really it was for those of you who are not uh, blessed to have that uh, character building moment last summer, <laughs> looking for a job when during that dumpster fire, uh, it was challenging. So I ended up creating my own little company I made it I made it so that I could jump on 1099 work and that's how I I ended up where I find myself now Um, project management uh, in construction uh, but I mean you know could be a variety of things I I was like I don't really know exactly what a construction project manager does but I'm gonna figure it out and and before long, it was it was uh, you know got to be humble enough to ask questions and do some research. But you can become whatever you need to be, just like that, you know, if you put put your mind to it. And you you bring up something that I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss, right? The figure it out. Um, going back to what you said earlier, you know that second Marsoc deployment, work, working more mm-hmm. in an austere environment, right? Let's talk about the importance of especially the recon and MARSOC community, call it other spec ops communities. Mm -hmm. I know more Marine Corps than I do the other branches. Uh, But someone can be as physically strong as just a freak of nature and not make it into the community, right? For sure. And that's because, and you and I, Jamie and several others, we. I don't even know how many times we've had this conversation is you know you got to be strong and you not only got to be smart but you have to have the natural ability to figure things out because Mm -hmm. we don't have the time to teach you how to go figure things out could we yes but we don't have the time for that so so a lot of these assessments in docs uh whatever they're calling all the other ones now i mean i don't even know i mean you and i were joking i've (laughs) thought boot camp was eight weeks long and you're like no fool it was longer than that that's how old you're getting it. You're or like longer. what you like to do is you're like well back in 1877 it might have been <laughs> yeah, yeah. eight weeks long. i'm pretty sure yeah, when you're when you're gearing up for world war ii i think hey, 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 the time. Hey, not that old or like or like that day whenever you sent me that picture in that group thread we got of a pirate ship you're like hey was this the mew you were on and i'm like really really or when you introduced me to uh who was it mike and you're like you're you're like yeah, I mean, when he was transitioning from Korea to Vietnam, you know, I was like, come on. Well, you got to respect your elders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, and he was like, oh, who was it we were talking to? You were like, yeah, you know, we got the name Leatherneck because Span was actually in whenever they wore the leather straps and not get their heads cut off. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> is, uh, but... Um, but having that natural ability to figure out, right? For sure. And and, and that's, that's a skill set that 
in the recon and MARSOC community, if someone doesn't naturally possess, they just they weren't going to DOR. They were just going to get dropped, right? Because we don't have time to do it. Doesn't mean you're a bad Marine. Doesn't mean yeah. you're, you're not a smart Marine. It's just there's a certain skill set that comes with that. It's uh, very entrepreneurial, right? That, for sure. Yeah, of like for sure. figure just it f- out. Figure it out. I got a story for that. So Jamie was on this deployment. So figuring it out, right? I mean, yeah. you, when you, you train hard, everything starts in training, everything. You try to train to the most impossible scenarios because you don't know what's going to come. You just try to make it as tough as you can to weed out the guys who can't make it, make the guys who are there more resilient so that they can solve whatever puzzle may come. So we were downrange. We were in these giant vehicles that weighed a ton, like literally tons. They're, they were called R, RG vehicles, RG 33s and 31s. They stood like... 15, 20 feet high and, you know, massive giant wheels on these things, right? So we were driving around the area where where our base was, just looking for trouble. You know, we had had a plan and, and we were following our route in formation, like good Marines. Where we were, we had probably five or six vehicles in a row you know because you're following the tracks of the vehicle in front of you and uh we realized we were we were on the wrong path we kind of needed to be a couple hundred yards over you know like we, we just need to make a course correction and we had this big beautiful field between us and the road so we all well we all we all decide you know what we can we can get over there we just got to cross this field and as we start driving into this field five of the six vehicles that we were driving in all got stuck at the exact same time in hip deep mud dry as a bone everywhere else (laughs) you can't even make this up and as the harder we tried to get out the deeper we sank and it was a little bit of a pucker factor at this moment because we were you know and we were we were not uh welcome in that area you know mm-hmm. <laughs> they were and so this isn't really too much literally in the kill zone we were right where we wanted to be when we had a little bit I mean, we weren't stuck <laughs> you know? so we're 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 sitting there scratching our heads trying to figure this out and it's not like a much of a secret anymore but we could we could hear they have radios they speak to each other on radios and we have interpreters who are listening they would tell us when something is important to say so our turp comes running over and he's like hey hey they say they're ready to attack i'm like of course they are (laughs) of course they are and then he's like he's like no wait no wait one of them says don't attack there's no way they could, this has to be a trap. No one's this stupid. <laughs> these vehicles stuck. They have to be trying to sucker us in. Don't, don't do it. And we're just like, yeah, no, no, we, we're, we did, we did, the, we, we done this. <laughs> we did this. It ended up being, he's, uh, how do we get out of that? We ended up, so we were on a, we were on a, co-located on a base with another team, uh, army team so i'm sure they had lots of funny jokes to to come tell us when they brought the giant truck the a wrecker to come pull us out so pulled us out one by one not really too much of a climax to that story other than uh no one even not one round was fired that day but i mean had they it would have been awful but the point being how do you train for that (laughs) how do you get guys who are willing to run through the a through Z possibilities on how to get out of that situation. We did. We tried everything, <laughs> everything. Finally, we you know we found a solution, but it was a it was a challenge. <laughs> it was a challenge, but that's how you you know that's how you just create problem solvers. Get out there and do it, and don't don't settle on like oh shucks I tried. You know, just well, gotta do and it. I, and I think you're being very humble about this. As funny as the story is, <laughs> is you're going A through Z trying to come up with a solution under an incredible amount of stress. Like at any moment, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
it, it's going to start raining mortars, right? Yeah. Like, like any any moment. And and how long were y'all out there stuck? <sighs> well, definitely the better part of an afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, we were there. So for it wasn't hours. just a couple minutes. Yeah, it was right? hours. Yeah. yeah. And and so you're under <laughs> high pressure, high stress. Oh yeah. Solution coming up with solutions. Yeah, we right. Were, we were hooking trucks up to each other, trying to pull each other out with the winch systems just getting worse we drive one truck could drive around we drive that one around from another angle try to pull it out they were so stuck <laughs> they, were so, they were so stuck <laughs> anybody in that team listening to this story is cracking up laughing right now oh yeah we, <laughs> there was, yeah there's nothing you could do but laugh at that point yeah <laughs> that's you know and that's the and that's an important element in this you know in, in, in this evolution is it, it, you're you had the ability to figure it out you always had the ability to figure out some ideas work better than others sometimes right mm-hmm. and so now coming into the business world is it's never been more essential than to have someone who Absolutely. knows how to figure it out because i mean we kind of had a pandemic riots mm-hmm. protests very very um, volatile election, hurricanes, fires, and then, I mean, hell, what what more could we just add? Let's mm-hmm. just watch Texas freeze for an entire week. We're almost like in a third world country where people are filling up bathtubs yeah. of water just so that way they have water, right? Can't even make this stuff up. Literally can't make this <laughs> stuff up. Greatest nation in the world, and we're filling bathtubs full of water. Yep. To get through a couple of days because of, of situations. Let's on. say it's fair to say we underestimated that snowstorm. <laughs> In the detective's office, we call that a clue. <laughs> <laughs> let's, 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 uh, let's just chalk that one up as a, a, a missed assessment. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's why I think it's the, the importance of, you know, finding, you know, folks like yourself that have operated in the most austere environments, essentially done a startup with little to no direction of like, here's a blank sheet of paper, write the story, and then evolved through each and every deployment from there, Mm -hmm. being able to, um, you know, be agile and pivot when necessary. And then on top of that, getting you know a higher education like an mba to be able to tr- take those skill sets and translate those to real world business today for critical problem solving when business right now whether it recognizes it or not needs critical problem solving without a doubt right now more so than ever yeah right i mean like we've got an issue with this is so and justin and i talked about this one um uh, on his episode and talked about it on several. Actually, I think I've been talking about this for like six months. It's like right now, business has a big problem is we're coming out of this and business wants to get geared back up and making money and spending money. But it's hard when you got nobody that shows up to work. Yeah. Right. And so that's another thing that you bring to the table is like, I don't think anybody would ever, ever doubt our work ethic. Right. Uh, nor would I mean we would actually look at them and challenge them and say mm-hmm. bring what you got right yeah. and uh, like I was telling you you know Peterson's working with me now right and and he's got six eight weeks with me <laughs> and he only thought poor guy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea what he was getting into he's like literally your job is to yell at me every day and I was like mm-hmm. no that's not my job I just take great personal enjoyment <laughs> yeah, of yelling at do you that for free <laughs> right and uh you know also a marine you know he was in the Iraq invasion and mm-hmm. and just just telling him saying man look there's a lot of things that you might be able to do more than me but you'll never outwork me I can promise you, you if you get up at four I'll get up at three if you get up at three I'll get up at two essentially I'll get to a point where I just never sleep because challenge we have that accepted. kind of drive <laughs> challenge accepted <laughs> And I think one of the things that gives us our ability to be able to have that work ethic is something that comes from that recon and MARSOC community, which is mm-hmm. the ability to be focused, mm-hmm. right? Talk to me about being focused and what that means. 
I, I would, I would bring it back to, to training. All right. So you're trained for the craziest things you can possibly come your way to prepare your mind for all the, all the possibilities that may come. Uh, but you know, when you're in a spot like that, it's, it really boils down to, like you said, how, how, how well can you focus? You know, I hear guys on the radio in a firefight or or some, something, crazy is going on in the background and you can hear the utmost calm in someone's voice I'm sure you as a police officer I'm sure you heard a wide variety on on that scale of calm and frantic Mm -hmm. Um, who's not drawn to that that calm voice in the room when it's chaotic you know I I I recall being in in a a firefight Um, I had a mortar team calling in mortars here i had a casualty over here i had a uh, guys a maneuver element over here and all of this was going on at the same time and to this day i can remember everything minute by minute exactly how that whole thing went but i tried and always did try and always will try to be that that calm voice on the radio to to center everybody and keep all of the plates spinning at the same time and Really, I'm at my best when I'm doing that. Like you're talking about how busy you are, and you know, I was, I would, I like, I like hearing that. I like bringing that in my life because, with without a, a full plate, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm uh, missing out on something, you know. Yeah, and it, you know, it's kind of funny because I have, I have been a, an enormous crybaby here for the last two <laughs> weeks, right? Like I am not gonna lie, I have been a total bitch. <laughs> for the last two weeks. I mean, that's how miserable this has been. And you and I were joking earlier before we came here, like, man, I I literally told Laura the other day, I was like, man, I was like, I was so less stressed when people were trying to kill me for a living. But it goes, (laughs) you know, but it it is kind of funny is, and and Laura laughs at us, right? Is like, she was like, you guys could be the biggest crybabies, even though you're like, you could literally go overtake a country with four of you, right? And I was like, I know. We just like to complain to complain. You know, we just like to bitch to bitch about things. But it, it, it what's really funny, though, is it does come back to that. The higher the stress turns up, actually, how much calmer we are. So it's really mm-hmm. kind of funny. It's like my in-laws were over. Last night was my mother-in-law's birthday. And... Uh, um, and so Laura's sitting there telling him, like, yeah, I, I don't know. Then all the years we've been married that I've seen Span this stressed out. And my mother-in-law was like, you're stressed? I was like, oh, yeah, man, I am, I am completely just stressed out. She goes, well, for someone that's stressed out, you know, really show it, you know, because I think <laughs> that just by how guys like you and I are designed is the higher the stress is, it doesn't mean we don't feel it. It's just a calmer we get right Mm -hmm. like when people are are, you know you and i are in a room and with a bunch of other people and someone starts shooting up the room most people are going to freak out our heart rate actually kind of goes down doesn't mean our stress level doesn't go up we just learn to manage it in such manners to where we don't let it prevent us to go do what we need to do like james was laughing uh at me he was like i think this was like uh last week and there is this on the sizable deal required me to spend this is not an exaggeration of 20 straight hours of analysis on this thing right and and like i don't like sitting behind a desk and looking at spreadsheets and everything else and he just goes you didn't skip a beat though like you didn't stop till it was done and and i was like no and he, and and he was just I think he gets a little fascinated by that too. I mean he he does it to you know pretty good pretty good levels, but I think guys like you and I and you know just how we are about design and what we've done, it just this is a part of who we are, right? If it needs to be done, it's going to get done right. no matter what part of me needs to be sacrificed in order to get that done and push through. Now, it doesn't mean that if I can't take the opportunity to complain about it, that I won't take the opportunity to complain about it just because I like to complain about things, but going to jump on it. It, it. But it's that ability to jump in and be that hyper focused, right? And to be that. Com- so, another example is, and I've used it several times on uh, uh, these shows, and you, you brought it up, is to be that calm voice. So, when the pandemic first kicked off, 
and Jeremy, my GM, was stressed, right? I mean, he, look, I'm, I'm stuck in Colorado. He's back here. He's restaurants are shutting down everywhere and he is wound up. And so we're on the phone and he's literally screaming at me on the phone. And then he hangs the phone up on me. And Laura and Maggie could hear it. And they were like, why are you, why would you let him talk to you like that? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, he's under a lot of stress. And, and Laura goes, well, I get that. But like, you just stay completely calm and everything else. And I said, well, let me ask you something. When a situation turns very chaotic, does it help if I add to the chaos by not remaining calm? If anything that's going to help control the situation is by remaining calm because the other voices, like you said, do attract to the calmer nature of it, where eventually it's like, everything's going to be all right. Yep. It's Breathe. like a duck on the lake. Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty going on under the water, but look like that duck for everybody yeah and you just sit there and breathe and it's you know and it, it's kind of funny is you know i'll tell folks they're like man what's the key to high stressful situations i'm like breathe just mm -hmm. don't forget to breathe like even in shooting right breathing's an essential part in shooting sure. right you ever, you ever watch an nba player, player slow down when they take those free throw shots yeah <sighs> just once or twice helps out yeah and so I, I tell you, I, I remember when you were making your transition last summer and, and, and I was, man, I was like, bro, you're, you, you have so many assets to offer folks. And that's why I was glad to see you, you know, take that route to, to, to go be a 1099, right? So that way you could have more autonomy yeah. and be able to brand yourself and show to other companies, other listeners out here that have companies or businesses that that you know need some no kidding looked at and assessment because look, as a business right now, if if you're not evolving and doing something a little different and, and self assessing, you're going to be in a world of hurt in the next 12 months if you haven't done it in the last 12 months with everything that's gone on in the world. No right? Doubt. 20, 2021 is yeah. only only half over. Just what's around the next corner? <laughs> oh yeah. Or like when I joke around and I go, well, you know, what I mean, what's everybody going to do when COVID 20 comes around? They're like, what's COVID 20? I was like, I don't know. We had 18, 17, 16, and 15 before we got 19. So 20 is bound to come around at some point. <laughs> something's coming. Right. Something's coming. <laughs> and uh, and I can't think of anybody better than um, someone like yourself who is experienced a startup that literally y'all were given almost no direction. It was just like, hey, we're just going to stand this up, go figure it out. Yeah, and a lot then, of moving the goalposts uh, at various times once you think you've got it figured out. So yeah. As, as I read, as I've read, it tend to, tends to be accurate for other startups. Oh, yeah. And, and, that's <laughs> an, and that's important, too, is to – or even when a startup is going from startup to stabilization, right? Mm -hmm. Those are still two different – I mean, look, sure. man – you know when it's you're changed. when you're when you're storming before you get to norming mm -hmm. right there's a there's another transition and and in order to cross that chasm you need an out outside set of eyes and ears and thought power to come in and look and assess and go because just like going back to what you said which i thought was man just so on point and of course knowing you the way i know you just made sense for you is like hey yeah i i, I could go grab you know the old cats that really know how to go do this, but I would rather go grab the new ones and bring them in and help them evolve. So that way, eventually when that chasm does need to be crossed, you've at least got some young energetic blood that can come in there and do it. And to be able to share the ability to go, hey, it's not about, and I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, it's, it's not about necessarily having the answers, it's about asking the right questions. For sure. Right? I mean, when you're, when you're in a team, especially when you've, spend so much careful time selecting you know you're put, trying to surround yourself with the best guys possible yeah is that the is that the time to start you know talking and not letting anyone else <laughs> yeah. to throw out some ideas i mean you surround yourself with the best guy the best team for a reason you know? yeah well, let's hear what they have to say yeah and i would be amiss if i didn't touch on this is if there's anything that you and i understand from the environments that we come from the value and true meaning of what trust is. For sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, look, people can call it loyal, 
whatever they want. But man, there is just something about the nature of trust. Talk to me about trust because I mean, like when I when I, when I think of you, that's one of the number one characteristics that comes out is not only does Kaz demonstrate trust, but he understands what that means from a level that the majority of the planet will never understand the true essence of what that word actually means. For sure. Yeah. You know, that's something veterans tend to miss, you know, about their days in the uniform is just being on teams where the, the, the trust is, you know, just like, yeah, that's good. That's already, but not next, you know, and that's really what you want to get to is like, you trust somebody enough that you're not thinking about whether he's trustworthy anymore. And now it's just, all right, well, let's solve the problems because I trust that we both have the same best interests in mind. We're trying to make this thing happen. I trust that you're not going to leave anything in the tank if something needs to be done. You're not, if you're running into something, it's for sure not for lack of effort, you know? So all these different aspects of trust help, you know, help move that, that team forward much faster and more efficiently than if you had to waste energy wondering if this guy's going to stab me in the back or not, you know? Yeah, and, and it goes back to a, pr- a previous example you use is you're breaking down a situation, everybody's got different ideas, agendas of how they feel like it should be going, but once mm-hmm. the table's slapped, yep. the trust is there. It's like, hey, even though Kaz might have thought this way might be better, mm-hmm. but this person has slapped the table to say this is the way we're going, the team can look at Cass and say, hey, Cass is not going to deviate from the plan because Cass wants to do what Cass wants to do. Mm-hmm. Cass is going to do what's good for the team, which is this is what we all you know, agree with is how we're going to go move forward. And that's important because especially out here in the business world, there are people that have agendas for sure that might say, okay, table slap, let's go that direction. And then they deviate, causing more, more stress on the component that needs to be accomplished, right? Yeah, I, I was a little naive when I first entered the civilian world. I had I did not expect that when when I encountered it, it was it was definitely a, a good lesson to to see it right there in your face. Like, and it was probably wow, about as foreign of a lesson as you ever knew because for was. twenty years you didn't ever work in an environment where that occurred. For sure, right? It was, yeah, yeah. It was it was. It was a bit of a shock. I was, I was, uh, all right. That's how the game is played. All right. (laughs) Watch out for you. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that's also another value that you bring to companies too, that you've demonstrated since being out of the Marine Corps with other companies is to be able to go, Hey, listen, get it. You got your agenda and you want to take your ball and go home because your idea wasn't the one we agreed on. Mm -hmm. But you're really a, a good at being a master of bringing people to the table to go, look, I get it. Your your feelings are hurt because your way is not the way we're going to go do this. But you're really a master at helping articulate to get them to understand why they should not deviate for own selfish reasons, that the unselfish nature of doing this together is why that should move forward. And, and, and that's one of the things that I, I've known about you for a long time is you're just, your ability to articulate that to a room in what I'll call a Kaz charismatic style. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't say Marines are known for their empathy or anything, <laughs> but, but I don't, I, you know, in, in my studies and acclimating to the civilian world, I learned about this, this notion of the uh, EQ or, you know, or, mm-hmm. or your equity quotient, you know, kind of like your ability to read people and and give them what they need and foster the right whatever that person yeah. needs to to pull it all together right and then really what you know what that boils down to me is it's like it's just finding people's motive you know if if you can boil down what drives somebody you could tailor your leadership style to suit that person to suit everyone on the team you can't use the, the same tool on everybody you know maybe this guy needs this this firm hand or you know say this woman operates better when you praise her publicly you know or this person would rather you just like 
text him and don't talk to him you know and this person wants to give a good get a good like you know you got to treat everybody with with what they need and if, if you can read that room and you can figure out what motivates everybody and then use use those tools to get the whole team across the finish line then treat them fairly not equally right it's right. Yeah, different yeah. shapes and sizes. And I mean, and that's, yeah. when, and that's the brand and reputation that you have. I mean, even to this day, yeah. right? Everybody that, that has had any part of the community, when your name comes up, I mean, it. there's, everybody's like, yeah, Kaz, that guy, man, he, he branded himself in his, in, you know, in the, in the recon and Marsoc community as being that leader that everybody looked up to. Right, and that's you know Appreciate one it. of your one of, one, of, one of your one of your traits that is what's strongest about you is both a blessing and a curse, is that you are as humble as you are, right? And you don't you don't talk about all 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 the great things you've done. That's the reason I wanted to drag you onto this podcast for so long is because, man, the value you have to offer everybody is not something that you're going to be outspoken about, right? Yeah, there's. And it, that's something I really had to learn coming out of the coming out of the Marine Corps. I'm like all of my mentors growing up are stoic. You know, they're stoic people. I, the thing I liked about them is that they suffered in silence and they didn't just you know didn't weren't braggarts and did, you know didn't really hear from them until they had something to say and then you listen. You yeah, know? that's always how I've tried to fashion myself. Now coming out of the Marine Corps, you know, you have to crack that book open a little bit and be able to sh you show be somebody, able to vocalize you know? it, right yeah. and that's you know like me being the mouth of the south i was like <laughs> well if you're not going to do it then i'm going to drag you on this show and we'll do it for you I so did. we could tell the rest of the free world that <laughs> hey you you need someone to come in and solve some problems Gaz is your guy when you first invited me to come on i was like hell no <laughs> <laughs> I'm not only no, but I don't know. <laughs> then after a while, I was like, "All right, all right, I'll, I'll, okay." I decided I decided to work it up. <laughs> I had to I had to get some momentum going. And then after a while, I'm glad I did because you know, this has been, this has been good. Yeah. This, this when been you call me a couple of weeks, you like you go, you're like, "All right, screw it, I'm coming on the show." <laughs> <laughs> when are we recording? <laughs> Book it. Book it. We're doing it. So. I like to end cap all these going back to 20 year old self right mm -hmm. now not that 20 year old self would listen to present day self but if you know you could go back for five minutes because you heard 20 year old self would be willing to listen to just one nugget mm -hmm. right of what you should or should not do what would you go back and tell 20 year old self now i, I would definitely if I could teach one lesson to to a younger a younger Kaz, it would be um, throughout my life I've had opportunities where I could have been the leader, and I chose not to, and those are among the only regrets I've ever had. So if you, young Eric, <laughs> young Kazmaier, if you have an opportunity. And that little voice inside you is saying to do this and you decide not to because you know that's what I try to teach my kids all the time whether they're listening who knows but they don't miss that opportunity because that'll that that's the way it should be done take the opportunity be the leader and do it right that's what that's what I would teach myself Man, one of the things I love about this show is the candid responses I get on that. Nobody, I have yet to have somebody come in here and throw up some BS cliche. This is what I would tell 20 year old self mm -hmm. because yeah. you know the candid nature when you're saying something that you're like, well, if I really got to be honest, I'm going to go back and tell myself this. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. that's one of the things that's made this show really special. Okay. So somebody needs some more CAS in their life. <laughs> how, do they, how, do, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, email me, okay. uh, Eric uh, K A S M I R E at gmail dot com. Okay, and then we'll have uh, your LinkedIn and everything else on the yep. uh, podcast. So 
For the audience, in case you missed it, you can always go to myexperiencedrealtor.com, click on podcast, go down to Eric Kazmaier, click read more, and we'll have all the connections to be able to connect you. And I'm telling you, if, if you are dealing with blind spots, if you are dealing with some challenges in your company or you're trying to take your company from one environment to the next, if you're not calling Kaz, then you're missing out because this guy will take it down. And as natural as always, if you're looking to buy and sell real estate anywhere on the planet, kick the, uh, click the home button, go to find a trusted professional. Even if it's not in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, we will find you a, a good person to make sure that they take care of your financial interest. Thank you, brother, My for man. coming on. What's you think? Uh, that was good. That was good. I yeah. had fun. I, I did.